Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, building the ultimate home theater media PC build video. This is a detailed step-by-step -step guide. In a couple of minutes, I'm gonna put the camera overhead and we're gonna put all these parts together in a follow along format designed to allow you to follow along and build your own PC at home. Even if you don't use these exact components, you can use these build guides to guide your own build if you are new to building or perhaps you have not built a computer in a while. Now there is a previous video in this series and it goes into great detail with all these parts. It talks about the PC this is going to be replacing for me. This isn't just a build for the channel. This is going to be my personal media PC for my home theater and actually to provide video throughout my house. So linked in the video description below will be that first video, but it's nearly 30 minutes long and it's great details and not everybody wants to see all that and I understand. So what I'm gonna do here first is do a really quick parts overview that is not 30 minutes long because not everybody wants to go back and watch a different video before watching this. So if you just came to this for the first time, not to worry, unless you want the background details and the nitty gritty behind every choice, this should be enough. This is an i5-8400 build, not a 9400 build like I talked about in the previous video. I actually have a 9600K right here. This we're not going to be using for the build. Instead, we're going to be using the CPU that Intel was kind enough to provide to me. Yes, they sent me this sample. And it's an 8400, six cores, six threads, turbos to 3.8 gigahertz on all six cores. For a media PC, it's wonderful. The Intel integrated graphics is great for video encoding, decoding, transcoding, etc. It does a great, great job. We're gonna be installing that CPU on this ASRock H 370 performance board. It's not a Z board, so we can't overclock, but we don't have an overclockable processor. It is, however, a premium featured board, 10 phase power delivery, which is frankly insanely overkill for the CPU, but eh, you know, it, it'll handle anything you want to put on it. Uh, ALC 1220 audio, it's the good signal to noise radio, ratio audio. It has three M.2 slots, two for drives and one for Wi Fi. It has Intel Gigabit LAN. It's got six SATA ports tons and tons of features, USB 3.1 Gen 2 support. If you're looking for a premium build, it's a nice option. And it's not very expensive either. It's under $100, which a, a good Z370 uh, board with all those features will definitely run you over that. So it's a nice, nice choice. We'll be installing that board into this wonderful case. This is a Corsair Carbide 200R mid tower. Covered it in detail in the previous video. Here's the short version. No RGB, no plastic panel, no glass, no bling. This is a home theater PC. You're supposed to be watching your television, not the computer. So there's not even a side panel on this. It's just, it's just metal on this. Well, there is a side panel, it's metal. 11 drive bays, including three five and a quarter inch bays. Yes, we'll be installing a Blu-ray player in this, but it get, how many cases don't even have any five and a quarter inch bays anymore? It has four three and a half inch drive bays and four two and a half inch drive bays inside. Plenty of room. It's got room for fans on the top, fans on the side, fans on the back. This case is $65. If you're looking for function more than form on a reasonable price, give the Corsair Carbide 200R a look. It doesn't get a lot of promotion and Corsair did not send me this by the way. I've had this on the shelf for a while now and I pulled it out and said, you know, that would make an awesome media PC. So they did not in fact send me that. Now, cooling the CPU, normally you could use the Intel stock cooler. I actually have a shelf of Intel stock coolers because I have a YouTube channel. Um, Intel did not send me a stock cooler because they don't do that when they do press samples. It doesn't matter. We're gonna be putting this Be Quiet Pure Rock on here. And the reason for that, it's way overkill for the CPU, zero fan speed. I'm gonna set up a custom uh, fan profile in the BIOS of the motherboard so that when there is a light load on the CPU, the fan's not turning at all. This is gonna be a completely silent system. No noise whatsoever unless there's a load placed on the system. 150 watt TDP cooler, 65 watt CPU, and under light loads, it might only be pulling 20 or 30 watts. So the fan won't, it'll be a passive cooler. It's uh, $40 for this cooler, but in exchange for that price, we're getting silence. If you don't want that much silence, by all means use the Intel stock cooler, but frankly, I want a silent computer so it does not interrupt our movie and TV watching fun. As for system RAM, we have 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 3200. 
2666 would be just fine. You don't need 3200. Why am I putting 3200 in? Corsair was nice enough to send this to me and it's what I had on the shelf. I actually don't have any 2666 sitting on the shelf. Irony, they didn't send me the case, they sent me the RAM. It is what it is. Speaking of cases and fans, Corsair, I love you, but your fans are not the quietest things in the world. This does come with pre-installed fans. I will, however, be replacing them with Be Quiet Silent Wings 3 fans. Why? These are so much quieter than Corsair fans. Corsair fans are fine for a gaming system or something you're using in an office where a light background hum isn't too big of a deal. But I have used these fans on two other builds, my streaming PC and my content creation PC, which I do voiceovers on. These legitimately straight up are noticeably quieter than anything else that I have tested. So if you want silence, it's called Be Quiet for a reason. Now, as far as storage goes, I have two SSDs that I'm putting onto the motherboard itself. One of them is an Intel 660p 512 gig NVMe drive. This will be the boot drive. Super fast boot, super fast shutdown, super fast updates, super fast everything. It is not the fastest NVMe out there. The 760 would be faster. A 760 Evo would be faster completely. This is frankly unnecessary. And then because I want room for video backing up off of DVDs, I'm putting in a one terabyte Western Digital Blue M.2 drive. Now this is a SATA serial ATA drive. It is not a PCI Express NVMe drive, doesn't matter. But what it does do is provide really fast, large temporary space for large numbers of files. Then we're going to have some hard drives, four three and a half inch bays in here. I have four, four terabyte Seagate, 5,900 RPM, energy efficient, relatively silent drives. I actually pulled these drives out of my i7-4770K. I've done another video on that, uh, story time with tech. Um, you may or may not have seen it yet, but I talked about that and about how these used to be my main storage in that. I pulled them out of there because I didn't need them anymore. I have an external storage array now. So this is gonna provide me with 16 terabytes of storage in here to serve all of the movies and TV shows throughout my house. As a fun bonus, I am also going to be installing some additional SSDs because there are four 2.5 inch drive bays in here as well in addition to those and I have a bunch of small drives I have nothing else to do with that aren't worth putting into a system. This is an Intel 330 series 180 gig drive. This is an Intel 330 series 120 gig drive. This is a crucial BX300 240 gig drive. And this is an AdLink 120 gigabyte drive that I actually reviewed a while ago. This is their S10. This was a product sample. These were not. Uh, these two Intel drives I've actually had for years and years and years. They're not new at all. That BX300, I bought myself for something else, but I don't put anything smaller as a boot drive than 500 gigs anymore. And so what I'm actually gonna be doing is taking these four SSDs and making one drive letter out of them. It's sort of swap space for copying or moving files or going from one drive to another from this to the, to the big SSD. Partly it's just because they've been sitting on my shelf for a while and I have nothing else to do with them. And even the, nice, the nicest drive here, the Crucial uh, BX300, it's a 240 gig drive. I'm not going to make a 240 gig boot drive in anything anymore. I just, with everything I do with computers, I won't. And so it's been sitting on the shelf. It's going in here because I can. Now this motherboard has six serial ATA ports. One, two, three, four, five, six, wait, seven, eight. Interface card, two serial ATA ports. We'll put that in during the build. That provides us with eight, no big deal. So what else are we putting in here? Power supply, EVGA 550 watt Supernova G3, 80 plus gold. This is way, way overkill for a build at this level. I would normally never recommend something this nice, except while I'm filming this with a mail-in rebate at the moment, this thing's only $60. So actually that's pretty reasonable. Fully modular, no cable management issues because you just use the ones you need. Here's what's most important, zero fan speed mode. This thing is not even gonna turn its fan on until it's under load. Most of the time while the system is running idle, that won't turn at 
all. And even when it does, it'll be so low of an RPM, you'll never hear the thing. So that's pretty nice. I won't take it out of the box right now, but this is a 14X Blu-ray writer from LG. Also reads, writes DVDs, reads, writes Blu-rays. That's going to be going into the front during the build process. And that pretty much sums it up for the build. If you want the detailed version of everything I just said there, go watch the original video down below. It goes into great detail, provides alternatives, talks about uh, pros and cons about going up and down on all the parts. but. I think most of you just want to see the build at this point. So now we're going to put the camera overhead and we're going to put all of this together. Here we have our build table, our motherboard and CPU. First thing, take the motherboard out of the box so we can install the CPU. ASRock boards are very nice because they come mounted on this foam. We'll cut off the clips in a second, but the first thing we want to do is install the CPU. This retention bracket comes up just like so and then the entire piece comes off. This is a protective cover which protects the pins on the motherboard. Do not touch this. Those are the actual pins. The CPU itself does not have any pins on the back. It is actually completely flat. These are just pads that will connect to the pins. Line up the two notches here with the two notches here in the socket and the CPU just sets down into place. You don't push it down, you just set it down gently and line up those two notches. At this point, you lower the retention bracket and make sure it's under this post right here. Push down on the lever, this does take some force, and the CPU is in place. The next step is to install our two M.2 drives. Now, this could be done while the machine is in your computer, but it's just much easier to do it right now. The mounting screws come with the motherboard. I'm going to take the drives out and we're going to mount them in the two slots. Take the SSD out of the plastic protective case very carefully that it comes in. And there is a notch and golden fingers on one end. That slides here. You can see the notch right there. Just into place like so. The screw, which is very small, mounts onto the end of your screwdriver. You simply push this down with your finger and you screw it into place. That's all there is to it. Our first SSD is installed. Taking our second SSD, this has two notches instead of one. That's because this is a SATA drive. This port supports both. Not a problem. It goes in label side up just like so and then screws into place. Two SSDs successfully installed. Just to cut in here, I was preparing the uh, backplate installation for the cooler and I was simply going to show you the finished process, but I want to talk to you briefly about installing these kind of custom coolers on here. You really need to take your time to read the instructions, measure twice and even three times. You want to take a look at the diagram, take a look at the part uh, layout, match up all the parts you need because you don't need all the parts with these custom coolers. Make a note of the diagrams, make a note of the mounting, and then check, check the fit of everything before actually trying to screw it all together. I now have the back plate set up. We've got these posts mounted through with these O-rings. I honestly have to say, this was not easy to do and I actually ended up having to redo it. So if you end up having to redo your mounting system, don't feel bad, it happens to the best of us. Be Quiet does have better mounting systems on their larger coolers. Their Dark Rock Pro 4 was very easy to install. This was not. This uh, Pure Rock needs a better mounting system. One more step towards having the cooler installed. This is what the two post mounting brackets look like. We've got the posts underneath, this screwed in. The cooler will actually mount to these two screws right here. Every cooler is different and sometimes an adventure. If we follow the diagram, their suggestion is to mount the cooler on this side, sucking air into the uh, fins here, the actual heatsink fins. Doing so does potentially block your RAM slots. We have lots of room over here. It may not be as efficient, but again, we don't plan to run this super overclocked. And so checking the direction of the fan, spinning it with our fingers, feeling the air, I'm actually going to put the fan on this side in a pull configuration to suck air through it towards the back of the case, leaving plenty of room for the RAM slots. Our cooler is now installed. Now we're going to move this out of the way and prepare the case. Here we have the front panel off of the Corsair 200 Carbide R. 
Here we're preparing the case for the motherboard installation, but first I said we were going to change the fan out, and we are. This is the front panel removed from the Corsair Carbide 200R. You can see it down here. There are three small clips down here that have to be unclipped right here. So be very careful pulling the front panel off of any case because if you just yank it and grab on it, then you'll snap those off. This unscrews using four screws here and we're gonna change the fan out. If you have never used a Silent Wings 3 fan, you don't know what you're missing. Yes, they are expensive, I acknowledge that, but they really are a premium product. The accessories, you can see that there are two different ways to mount it, one with screws, one with a vibration shock mount, and the various tools are in there. And then when we actually open up the fan itself, it's really well made. These are very, very nice fans. With Be Quiet fans, you certainly have the option to use the case screws, but these are anti-vibration fittings where there's actually rubber in between the case and the actual fan mount itself. What you do is you take these posts and they go through here and slide through these holes and provide you with a very quiet mount. And there we are, all four are pushed through and this is going to be Be Quiet. Putting the front panel on, we just line it up and snap it back into place. Just like so. With the case on its side, we're ready to install the motherboard. Thankfully, the 200R already comes with all of the posts pre-applied. This is a nice upgrade over the 100R. If you're looking for a budget case with good features, it's, it's not a huge deal, but it's very convenient. Now there is a Corsair exhaust fan here in the back. I searched and searched and I do not have a second Be Quiet 120 millimeter fan. I will have to get one. This is the hard one to change, so I went ahead and did the one in the front. This will take me five minutes at any point in the future. It's just four screws in the back. We'll replace that another time. For now, we're simply going to put the motherboard in place, centering it on the center post, and then we'll screw it in. But before we do that, can't forget the IO shield. I have done that before, installed the motherboard, got everything in and completely forgotten the IO shield. So let's get that into place. And there we go. The IO shield is safely mounted in place. I did install the cooler first. That certainly is an optional thing for now. That actually makes it pretty easy to install by simply using it as a guide. And we'll simply slide it into place, making sure we watch out for our fan cable here. Going around to all the screws, they are all firmly in place. Next step, let's install our power supply. Our power supply is now in place, screwed in the back. It simply drops down in there, fully modular, so all we have to do is add the cables one at a time. 24-pin ATX, 8-pin CPU power connector, and a couple of cables for the uh, drives back here, we need several SATA power connectors. I am not going to connect any of the PCI Express cables because we're not adding a video card. We now have the motherboard power cable installed, the CPU power cable installed, and a couple of SATA power connectors there around the back. Now we're gonna start putting some drives in. These toolless drive trays right here work really well. Simply put the connector in this way and pull the tab out slightly, let it slide down into place, and it just locks in. So our four hard drives are installed. That was very easy. We now have our four SATA SSDs installed. The top one here is a little bit loose because I don't have the spacer for it, but it's a solid state drive, so it's not gonna matter. The rest all fit perfectly. In order to install all eight drives, the motherboard comes with six serial ATA connectors but we have eight drives, so we need two more. In the process of putting this together, I had completely forgotten about the DVD drive, which also needs a connection. I, I have not installed a DVD or Blu-ray drive in so long, I completely forgot. So, we have two cards from two different companies that'll provide us with an extra port and leave us with one spare in the event I wanna add another drive in the future. If you don't want to install two cards, you can get cards that have four ports on them for not too much money, but I have these sitting on the shelf, so these are now installed, and now we're just going to have a bunch of cables to run. Lo and behold, it's always important to read the manual. As I was sitting here connecting up uh, cables, 
it dawned on me, wait a minute, many motherboards disable one or more ports when you install drives in the M.2 slots. Opening up the manual, if M2-1, which is this slot up here, if a SATA type drive is installed, then SATA port 2 will be disabled. It's not, that's an NVMe drive, a 660p NVMe. If M2-2 is occupied with a SATA type M2 device, SATA 1 is disabled. So I only have four ports to work, uh, excuse me, five ports to work with here. One of these ports is gonna be disabled, which means I need all four of the ports here now to make everything work. So it's a good thing that we have a spare. The joys of building overly complicated systems, <laughs> the trouble I'm going to to try to use these SSDs, really I could take these out. With the one terabyte SSD, these are, these are more for fun. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take these two cards out and the reason is the connectors on them are terrible. They're not locking. And instead, we're going to replace it with a single much better card. Here I have a single card that has four connectors and these have latching connectors on them. So when I click these in place, it actually clicks and holds. The other two cards didn't and the cables just slid right out. That's a really bad idea. So we're gonna use this much better card that I found on my shelf. Well, to my surprise, I went to insert it in the PCI Express 1X slot and it does fit actually because ASRock does these boards right, but I noticed something interesting. First of all, in ASRock's boards, uh, not all boards are like this, but they leave the back of the PCI Express slot cut out and some room here, so you can actually install a card larger than will fit and it will just hang out and run in 1X mode. This is a PCI Express 1X slot. This is the power connector here in the front, and then this is a 1X data connector. This is a PCI Express 2X slot. It's got twice as many slots, twice as many uh, golden fingers on the data side. I could actually install this here in a 1X slot and it would run at half speed mode, but why? That's unnecessary when I have all these extra slots. And so instead, we're going to install it here in this, this is actually a physical 16X slot, but electrically it's a 4X slot. There's actually no golden uh, connectors here past the 4X slot, but since it's a 2X, it'll work just fine. So we'll install that here and replace the plates. Yes, that's a mess of cables, but they're locked into place. I'm going to actually attach all of these to the SSDs and run the SSDs all off of this card, but we'll do that later once we connect the front panel connectors. And welcome back. There was a very large cut there while we worked on cables and actually got a cable extension and a splitter because I needed an extra one. We've got the SATA cables from the power supply plugged into the four drives back here. The red and blue SATA cables coming off the motherboard are powering the four drives back here. The add-in card will power the four SSDs. And then on the other side, there's a single black SATA cable, which will run the uh, Blu-ray drive, which we'll plug in here in just a minute. And I've done a little bit of zip tying back here. It's not the prettiest cable management I've ever done. We've got the CPU power connector cable tied. The, the, case, uh, the back of the case is gonna come right here and rest on the cables. And while it's not the prettiest job in the world, it isn't going anywhere. With the back panel reinstalled, you can see there's no mess whatsoever. Perfect cable management every time, or at least you're just never going to see it. So let's turn this back over. It is now time to install the 14X Blu-ray drive. I was originally going to install this on the top bay, but the cable doesn't quite reach. So it's not going there. Instead, it's going right here. The Blu-ray drive is now installed. Power and data are running to it. I had to rearrange the splitters here to make it work, but it does work. All the cables are plugged in. Serial ATA port one is underneath this. It's the port back there. It's not being used. The other five are being used. We've got our two storage devices mounted on the board. We have an ugly mess of cables running right here. And I don't know that there's really anything worth doing there because airflow is not an issue. We've got two fans here, the cooler, plenty of vents out the top. So I think we're pretty much done except for installing the RAM. Here we have two absolutely plain black and functionally boring sticks of Corsair Vengeance LPX. I call it boring, it actually works very well. It's very dependable. DDR4-3200, we will simply move out these two notches right here. And then, oh, there's plastic to remove. 
Okay, there's going to be a small peel. Can we take that off? Oh, look at that there. So we'll simply line that up, insert the first one into the slot, and it goes in just like so. One click, two clicks. First sticker RAM is installed. Put that over here. Might as well go ahead and do our shiny peel since there's really no other peels in this case. There you go. And that's out. So we line up our notch, slide it in right there. And one, two. 16 gigabytes of RAM is installed. All that's left to do now is to put the side panel on and you'll never even know all this cable mess is here. Putting our side panel on. With the side panel installed, there's actually two places for fans right here. You can see the Be Quiet cooler barely through it. Otherwise, no cable mess. Our build is now complete. You may notice that the computer is not on the desk. I'm filming this several days after I finished building the computer. I have since recorded a Windows Setup BIOS Update driver installation uh, video. That's coming up very soon. Make sure you're subscribed to be notified when that's coming. And the machine is already running as my new media center. Now, there were a number of great questions asked on the original video that I first put up. And I'm going to be answering questions beneath this and the next one as well. Maybe I'll do one more follow-up. Maybe I won't. But the short version is it's a much snappier, much more responsive experience. I'm really glad I did it. And frankly, it was probably a couple of years overdue. As nice as the i7-920 is, it's really feeling it these days. The new i5-8400 is snappier, more responsive. Uh, video ripping, playback, transcoding is all snappier. Just opening windows, running Chrome, launching browsers, browsing YouTube is more responsive. You can definitely feel it in that higher single core experience. So look out for the upcoming Windows installation video. Like this video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you love it. Remember, subscribe to my channel with a big, huge red button directly below. Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions, put those in the comment section. Check the links in the video description, the links to all the videos in this series. There'll be a playlist down there. Links to all the parts that I use, or close enough as I can get them, will be down in the video description below. And then my social media links will be down there as well. Be sure to hit that join button next to the sub button if you'd like to see more long in-depth videos like this. Supporting the channel directly helps me do this without sponsors and I would greatly appreciate your help. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.